updating. I got it. All right, there we go. And let me open it up. Perfect. So uh, as I was saying, um, I have a few titles. Uh, I'm primarily at the J JFK Neuroscience Institute. Um, I am the medical director of both the JFK uh, and uh, the Jersey Shore Medical Center Brain Tumor Centers uh, with Hackensack Meridian Health. So I thought we'd start by um, talking about the standard of care. I know the concentration was about glioblastoma. Um, this really does not limit it to glioblastoma, although some of the things may be. Uh, typically, when we talk about standard of care for brain tumor patients, uh, we want to make a tissue diagnosis. We want to know after a patient comes in with symptoms, which could be seizures uh, or weakness or headaches, uh, and we find through an MRI scan that there's a mass lesion in the brain, we want to know exactly what that mass lesion is. So we do this through surgical procedures. Sometimes it may just be a biopsy if a tumor is located in an area that's sensitive and can't be removed. It could include debulking, where the surgeon is able to get a uh, percentage of the tumor out, but it may be unsafe or unwise for multiple reasons to take the rest of it out. Or complete resection of the tumor. What we like to see is a gross total resection of what may enhance or light up after a patient gets contrast with the scan. So these are different types of surgical procedures uh, that can be done. And there are modifications or caveats to some of these when we have uh, tumors that are located in very sensitive areas of the brain. Uh, we may do uh, awake surgeries where the patient is awake so that we can monitor for neurological deficits. Uh, and we may do mapping during the time of the surgery where we're mapping eloquent areas before uh, we remove the tumor. For glioblastoma and some of the other malignant gliomas or anaplastic tumors, uh, surgery is typically followed by chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, on the slide, you'll see it says radiation therapy plus concurrent and adjuvant timozolamide. Uh, what that means is that the chemotherapy, in this case timozolamide, is given along with the radiation. Uh, the typical protocol is six weeks or 42 days of radiation and timidar or timozolamide. Radiation is given Monday through Friday, whereas the chemotherapy is given seven days a week. This may or may not include the option of alternating electric field therapy, also known as the NovaCure Optune device, which you'll be hearing in a future webcast. The NCCN guidelines are the National Cancer Care Network guidelines. These are developed by experts in the field, and I'll show you a couple examples of what these guidelines look like, but they help guide the treatment of uh, the patients that we take care of as neuro-oncologists. I've been practicing for 20 years. Uh, these guidelines haven't been around that long, and so uh, through my training, uh, sort of practice before the guidelines were even developed. Uh, these guidelines, are just that, guidelines. So there may be a change in the way that radiation is delivered, either for how long. Uh, it may be an adjustment in what chemotherapy is given, depending on the tumor type. And it also may allow, and it also allows for modifications based on a patient's age and their performance status. And what we mean by performance status is we're looking at, uh, are they able to do the activities of daily living? What are their deficits? What kind of care do they require? In addition to chemo radiotherapy, where you have, again, the six weeks or 42 days of radiation and chemo, it's followed by monthly chemotherapy, six to 12 months of timozolamide, not given every day, but typically given five days every 28 days. I'm a strong proponent of clinical trials. I, I like clinical trial entry for both my newly diagnosed and recurrent patients when clinical trials are available for them to enroll in. 
uh, and these uh, can vary uh, from uh, drugs uh, that are immunotherapies to standard chemotherapies. And I believe in the next couple of slides, I have uh, the list of clinical trials that we offer through uh, the Brain Tumor Center at JFK. Pathology is a very important part of the diagnosis. This occurs right after surgery where the pathologist will get the tissue and will uh, look at it under a microscope as well as sending it for some specialized testing. Uh, in February of last year, 2017, the World Health Organization changed the way that we uh, classify these tumors. So where we used to just look under the microscope and give a diagnosis based on what the pathologist would see, these are now uh, diagnosed that way, but in addition to having certain molecular markers that will classify them as to one tumor type or another. In addition, we do um, molecular profiling of the tumors and look for hypermutations. This can help identify um, current therapies that are out there that may or may not have potential benefit for the patients, but also identify targets for potential future therapies. And last uh, but not least, which is where we started on this slide, is imaging. Um, imaging takes place certainly before surgery, we make a diagnosis based on the patient's symptoms coming in. Some patients may have a CAT scan uh, followed by an MRI or maybe a CAT scan alone if there are reasons why an MRI scan, scan can't be done. We also use this imaging for surveillance as we're following patients through treatment. So after they receive the chemotherapy and the radiation, they'll receive an MRI approximately four weeks later. And then typically every two months while they're actively getting treatment. Sometimes scans are done a little earlier when a neuro-oncologist has a concern. Uh, but if somebody gets through that first six months or 12 months of the chemotherapy, as time goes on from that point, we'll extend the, interview before, uh, the uh, interval of the MRI scans or imaging um, as we go through time. And that's also uh, sort of outlined in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, I threw functional imaging on the slide because I think it's important to note that uh, functional imaging, uh, also diffusion tensor imaging, can map eloquent areas of the brain and also map the actual tracks uh, from one location of the brain to another. So speech, uh, hearing, vision, uh, this can be very important when determining how much of the tumor can be surgically removed. Uh, so it's an evaluation we do in certain cases before surgery, but also um, can be used to tell the patients what kind of deficits could occur from the surgical procedure. This is just an example of what uh, the NCCN guidelines uh, look like. Uh, this is for central nervous system neoplasms. In this particular case, anaplastic gliomas and glioblastoma. Uh, there are others for other tumor types and other uh, cancers of the body as well. Um, again, this starts with the MRI being suggestive of tumor, and then it gets down to where a tissue diagnosis is made uh, either one pathway or another. And it continues on, in this case, uh, glioblastoma. Uh, if somebody's under the age of 70 and has a good performance status, is methylated or unmethylated for the MGMT promoter, um, poor performance status. And then on another page, it goes for uh, different options for patients who are over the age of 70. So as I said, these NCC and guidelines allow for various treatment options and modalities. It's a, dis <clears throat> excuse me. it's a discussion between the neuro-oncologist and or treating medical oncologist and the patient to determine what treatment is the best pathway for a particular patient. Again, based on age, their performance status, patient's own desires uh, and wishes. Uh, where I practice, and I think that's true for most of the neuro-oncologists that I personally know, we try to balance quality of life with extending someone's life. 
Some of the clinical trials available through um, my practice and the JFK Brain Tumor Center, as well as the Jersey Shore Medical Center Brain Tumor Center, uh, are listed here, uh, the first three. Um, the first one is a trial involving uh, TSC, which essentially is a radiation sensitizer. Uh, it helps um, to create what we call free radicals in the radiation or tumor environment to help combat the tumor. In this particular study, it's for patients who have newly diagnosed glioblastoma who can only have a biopsy. This is nice since most studies that are out there usually look for what we consider a gross total resection or 98% of the tumor removed. This is a phase three trial. Uh, a phase one trial is where they're looking at the safety um, of a drug. Phase two is typically when they're comparing, I'm sorry, they're determining if a drug may work against a particular tumor. And phase three is where they're comparing it to the standard of care. In this case, it's sort of, and we've done this more and more now over the last five years, we've moved into rather than one step after another, which can take many years, we, we kind of move the trials into phase one, two, three all together in the sense that we're adding a particular drug that we're testing to the standard of care. And it's randomized between standard of care, as I described to you on the prior slide, radiation and chemotherapy versus radiation chemotherapy and the drug. That gives us safety information on the drug. It tells us if the drug works versus just the standard of care and does the comparison at the same time. This is a great way of evaluating these compounds so that we can move it through clinical trial and get it to patients quicker. The next trial available um, is a drug that is a PARP inhibitor. Uh, PARP, the, the way that radiation and chemotherapy work is that they damage the DNA. Um, PARPs are um, enzymes that go and repair the DNA normally in cell division. By inhibiting these repair mechanisms, we're hoping to improve the response to the treatment that we're given, prevent the tumors from growing back faster, extending a patient's survival and also, depending on location of the tumor, preventing growth that can lead to poor quality of life. The third trial is an observational trial. Patients receiving Galeadel wafer, either at initial surgery or for recurrent disease. Galeadel are chemotherapy wafers uh, that are about the size of a dime that can be placed in the surgical cavity and diffuse chemotherapy locally in the area. So this is an observational study uh, involving multiple centers on patients who have received that therapy and or will receive that therapy. There are two trials involving nivolumab. Nivolumab is an immunotherapy known as a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, again, it is standard of care versus standard of care with nivolumab. This is for newly diagnosed glioblastoma um, who receive a near total or gross total resection. And when we say that, we're looking for less than one cubic centimeter. So if you can imagine a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter in tumor tissue left to help make them eligible for the study. And those are the first two, both for methylated and unmethylated glioblastomas. The methylation uh, is something that we test routinely. Uh, it's important because patients who are methylated tend to respond better to the timazolamide uh, versus unmethylated patients who may still res respond but may not be as robust. The uh, third trial on this page, I'm going to talk to more over the next few slides. It's a trial I've been involved in for quite a while. There's some published data uh, out there. It is TOCA511, 
which is uh, has a long name you'll see on future slides that I won't go into, but it's essentially a retroviral replicating vector. Uh, it was a genetically modified virus that can attack the tumor cells while sparing the normal cells. This trial is for recurrent patients with anaplastic astrocytomas and glioblastoma. And I'll go through it um, on the next few slides. And then the last is for patients who were on the original trial of TOCA 511, uh, a continuation for those patients who continue to respond. Uh, and I have uh, two patients uh, that were treated for recurrent glioblastoma uh, about four and a half years ago uh, who are still uh, receiving the TOCA 5FC. Uh, one chose to stop, one is still on it. So TOCA 511, again, is the retroviral replicating vector. Um, over the next few slides, I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism by which it works. Um, I am a very um, strong proponent of immunotherapies. Um, I think that the future uh, of this field, cancer in general, is going to involve a combination of um, immunotherapies as well as our conventional chemotherapies that we've used thus far. Don't get bogged down by this slide. Uh, just look at where all the little brains are uh, as you go across the slide. The, the idea is that at the time a, a patient's tumor recurs, if they are eligible for surgical resection, I tend to recommend surgical resection. If they are eligible for surgical resection, then they may be eligible to receive TOCA 511. At the time of surgery, the tumor is removed, and the neurosurgeon will inject the retroviral vector into the surrounding tissue. There's multiple injections, over 40, to the surrounding tissue. The virus infects the brain tumor cell, but leaves the normal brain tumor cell, the normal brain cells alone. The virus incorporates a little strand of DNA into the tumor cell, and I'll show you that on the next slide. The patients then receive an oral medication known as 5-FC, 5-fluorocytosine, known as TOCA-FC. And TOCA-FC is transformed inside the tumor cell into a potent chemotherapy to kill the tumor cells. So essentially what happens is the virus is taken up by the glioblastoma cell. The virus makes each glioblastoma cell a chemotherapy factory. The chemotherapy kills the glioblastoma cell and at the same time, the 5-FU will kill immunosuppressive cells. This allows for a robust immune reaction against the tumor. So you have these little chemotherapy factories in the cancer cells killing the cancer cells. The viruses don't die, but then can go on to infect another cancer cell. If there's nothing rapidly dividing, they can lie senescent in the area until the tumor cell starts to divide again. At the same time, killing these immunosuppressive cells as well as non-infected brain tumor cells, allowing for, we call them antigens, but proteins to be identified by our immune system to say, hey, attack these molecules, go attack these molecules, and it creates a robust immune reaction against the cancer cells and the cancer stem cells to combat the disease. So most, a logical question would be, if you're just injecting around the operative cavity and these tumors are known to be infiltrative, well, why does it work? So the sponsor, Tokogen, did a study looking at how far beyond the injection 
the virus can go. And it went be well beyond by centimeters of the injection, as you can see by the brown staining in this slide. So the virus moves away from the injection site and out. This data was published in 2016. Um, it was um, the cover uh, for the scientific journal uh, in which it was published. Uh, it showed that there was a median overall survival uh, for all patients of about 13.6 months, and this is for recurrent disease. Again, not newly diagnosed. It was very well tolerated. In fact, the patients I've had on it really um, experienced fatigue, I would say, as the most common side effect, and loose stools. Not more, not uncomfortable, just looser, softer stools. Um, when compared to historical low mustine for recurrent glioblastoma, there was a significant improvement in survival. We are now involved in a phase three trial using TOCA 511 and TOCA FC, um, where we're comparing it to the study drug, the virus followed by the TOCA FC, to other standards that may be used for um, recurrent glioblastoma like lomustine, timazolamide, and bevacizumab or Avastin. For patients who may be hyper mutated, we might use a combination of Keytruda uh, or Pembro, which is another checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy, along with Avastin. Patients who are hyper mutated, um, typically patients after receiving timazolamide, may benefit from that immunotherapy. Um, it's being used, although there's no published data as yet to support its efficacy. And uh, the TOCA 511 data was published on the initial trial. We also studied patients who've had durable responses. So as I said, I have two patients who are four and a half years away from a recurrent glioblastoma diagnosis in their surgery who are still doing quite well, both with regards to survival and quality of life. Um, this data uh, has been pulled together and is being submitted for publication um, as we speak. It takes a multidisciplinary team. It's not the neurosurgeon, it's not the neuro-oncologist, but it's the group of physicians working and communicating together. At JFK, we run weekly uh, brain tumor boards that includes the specialists listed on the screen to discuss new cases and cases where there's recurrent disease. I do the same thing for Jersey Shore and Riverview Medical Centers. Um, I couldn't do my job as a neuro-oncologist without Patty Anthony, my nurse navigator, who develops an uh, incredible relationship with the patients and their families. Um, but it really does, uh, the old cliche, it takes a village. That's true for brain tumor patients at wet, uh, as well. It takes a village. It takes all of us working together to provide the necessary care to help these patients and their families. Oh, very good, thank you. Um, there's a few questions that keep coming up. The one that I'm getting all day, because an article just came out about it, do you feel that cell phones cause cancer? Uh, no, can you still see me out or no? Uh, now I can. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I'll leave my video off. So there's been a lot of um, studies, both uh, inside and outside the U.S., looking at cell phones and cancers, even looking at dental x-rays and certain types of uh, brain tumors. Um, being familiar with um, most of the data, uh, it, there does not seem to be, excuse me, a significant risk to cell phones uh, for uh, causing meningiomas, which is a type of tumor that occurs on the meninges of the brain, uh, or for acoustic neuromas, which is a hearing nerve tumor. Uh, a lot of the data that was out there in the past was sort of um, survey data where they contact patients who had these tumors and ask them about cell phone use or exposure to dental radi radiation. 
Having said that, technology is rapidly changing. Um, we don't use analog cell phones anymore. You know, we use digital and things continue to change rather rapidly. So I myself, and I recommend to everyone I know uh, to use Bluetooth devices so that you're not holding the phone uh, directly against your head for long periods of time because you just don't know um, as, as technology changes what, what may or may not occur. Is there a genetic link to brain tumors, especially glioblastomas? Um, so there's genetic syndromes where you can see certain types of brain tumors. So for instance, people who have acoustic neuromas or hearing nerve tumors on both sides, uh, they have something called neurofibromatosis 2, uh, which is a genetic syndrome. And there are other genetic syndromes where these tumors um, can occur. Uh, I have a colleague out in Tel Aviv, Israel, who did a population-based study, and there does seem to be, uh, albeit small, familial or genetic component um, to uh, glioblastomas and other brain tumors. In fact, I have uh, the daughter uh, of a patient who passed away uh, from a glioblastoma that I care for. It is, it is a low risk, but I do think it's there. Okay, you talked about methylation a few times. Can you just explain that in detail again? So there's something called uh, methylguanine methyltransferase, or MGMT. And uh, the promoter gene for that um, protein may be methylated or unmethylated. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain it like I explained to uh, my patients to try to simplify it. MGMT is an enzyme, but I think of it like a carpenter. When we give radiation and chemotherapy, we damage the DNA. And this MGMT, this little carpenter guy comes out and he fixes the DNA and the tumor starts to grow again. When the MGMT is methylated, or I say the carpenter has been drinking, and it can't function <laughs> normally, it doesn't, it doesn't fix the DNA. And so the tumors uh, are prevented from growing back uh, or, or getting worse uh, for a longer period of time. So patients who are methylated, where that enzyme isn't working very well to repair the DNA, uh, they tend to have a more robust response to alkylating agents like timazolamide uh, in the treatment of their tumors. Does that also apply to CCNU and BCNU? It applies to most of the chemotherapy agents. I think in, uh, since the STU protocol, it's, it's, the, it's the Timidar that we have the most uh, data on. Okay, can you talk a little bit about Avastin? It seems like it's controversial in that in some centers they'll use it for newly diagnosed, others will use it for recurrent, and others don't use it at all. Yeah, so um, Avastin, also known as Bevacizumab, is a monoclonal antibody that attacks uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. What that does is uh, VEGF, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, allows tumors to infiltrate and spread uh, in the brain uh, by creating blood vessels. The Avastin inhibits that blood vessel formation. The Avastin, when used up front with the radiation and Timidar, caused an improvement in progression-free survival. Uh, meaning the time before the MRI scan changed um, after they received the drug, so that time. But it did not provide a, any change in overall survival, so there was no overall survival benefit to the drug. I don't use Avastin up front. I save it for recurrent disease. So if the tumor grows back, it is one of the treatment options that I may use among several uh, to combat the tumor. Um, my concern with Avastin, and I tend to try to hold off using it for as long as possible, is that my experience when the tumors do start to grow in a patient on Avastin, there are very few options left that they may respond to. So I may choose a drug prior to Avastin if the patient's not eligible for clinical trial, which would be my, my primary motivation would be to try to get them into trial and save some of these other drugs like Avastin or CCNU um, for a later date. Okay, what's happening with these vaccines? 
they were so promising in the early trials, and then they all seem to fail the late stage trials. How could that possibly happen? Um, well, there's a couple of answers. Uh, a lot of drugs that we test, um, vaccines and otherwise, uh, do a remarkable job of treating tumors in rat or mice models, uh, but it doesn't seem to carry forth uh, in, in human studies. There was a trial I was involved in um, called ICT-107, which is a brain tumor vaccine against a particular um, immune or cellular component of uh, a patient's tumor, uh, six uh, proteins on the, on the patient's tumor, uh, that looked very promising early on. We were seeing significant uh, improvement in progression-free and overall survival. And then when we got to the phase two, phase three uh, trial data, the response was not as robust as we had seen before. And there can be many reasons why that happens. Um, one reason may be, you know, on the earlier studies, there's just not enough patients to draw a conclusion. Another uh, may be that you're looking for a certain subset of patients who respond very well to that treatment uh, versus subset of patients who won't. Uh, in fact, that data is also uh, being submitted for publication. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of reasons why it's hard to make the, the responses carry through into human studies. One is we don't have great models. It's not like you can recreate perfectly the microenvironment of a glioblastoma. And I think as we gather more information, we're learning more and more about the molecular uh, profiling and components of a tumor uh, that we're taking a harder look at, you know, are there certain factors within a particular tumor type that may want, make one treatment worthwhile, but another not. But I, am, I like the vaccine trials. I like the idea of stimulating a pa patient's own immune reaction against the tumor, the immunotherapies, the vaccines, the gene therapies. I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of those. Uh, will they be used in isolation? At this point, no. I think it's going to be a combination of our standard treatments, surgery, radiation, and conventional chemos, along with their drugs. We just need to, I mean, we've made such advances in the last five years uh, in this field. Although it's never an exciting time to be diagnosed with a brain tumor or other cancer, I think for the doctors who have been caring for these patients, um, we're seeing such strides and such advances in the treatments that for us, it's exciting because we're able to get these treatments to the patients to better their lives and their survival. Okay, thank you. Um, how long do you use Timidor for? It seems like every different center uses it for a different length of time. Yeah. The, the formal STOOP protocol that was studied uh, used chemo radiation followed by six months of Timidar. And, you know, we don't even know what the six months of Timidar does because all the patients had the chemo radiation followed by the, the, <clears throat> followed by the six months. Um, I, use, I use it between six and 12 months. So there's, there's a lot of factors that play into that. So I may have somebody who has counts, blood counts that have fallen dramatically during the chemo and the radiation that recover slowly. I'll reintroduce the monthly Timidar because it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll have their counts fall again. Um, some patients can't do the monthly at all because of blood counts. Some can only get through two, four months because of blood counts. For patients who are tolerating the drug well, not having significant side effects like fatigue or nausea and vomiting that aren't controlled, with medications, um, whose tumors are stable, particularly if there's still bulk disease there, I like going out to a year. So I would say most of the time I go out to a year, but there are times where it's going to be less than that. And I think most centers go between six and 12 months. You know, sometimes you hear 18 months. Uh, you know, the, the longer you're on a particular chemotherapy, although it's extremely unusual for Timidar, there is the risk of secondary malignancies like leukemias. Okay, thank you. Um, can you explain what proton radiation is? We see advertisements for this all over the place now. So um, in order to understand proton uh, radiotherapy, 
um, and to explain our conventional radiotherapy or linear accelerator radio surge, uh, radi radiation. But basically, for the, the radiation that we typically give, that is a completely appropriate radiotherapy, we're slamming electrons into a metal target and on the other side we get the treating photons and we treat a patient's tumor. Um, proton beam is using protons. The, the, the way that the protons are delivered is they can stop the radiation at a particular target. So whereas regular radiotherapy covers a, an area and we call it conformal, we're covering a certain amount of area beyond the tumor on purpose, you can stop the protons anywhere in space. The downside to that is if you cut it too short, you're missing tumor cells that could be treated. When they've studied proton beam versus the conventional radiotherapy that we, we use, particularly for brain tumors, there's no benefit to the protons. Having said that, in pediatric patients, particularly patients who have uh, what's called a libel chordoma, a tumor that's in the bone just in front of the brainstem, is a benefit to those patients to use the proton to reduce the risk of side effect. Um, but even for other uh, cancers, of which I'm not an expert, like prostate, they found no significant benefit to the proton beam. So in short, it's a lot of hype, but it is a valid form of radiotherapy like any other. Thank you. Do you ever tell your patients uh, to alter their diet? Some of the diets have been very popular, like uh, the ketogenic diet. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I mean, as a neurologist, uh, there are definite indications for ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet's a difficult diet. I, I don't recommend the ketogenic diet uh, for my brain tumor patients. I don't think there's any significant data to suggest a benefit. If somebody likes that diet or wants to go on that diet, I have no issue with them being put on it or, or going on it, but I don't uh, recommend it. I do recommend uh, to my patients um, to eat healthy, to exercise, um, to have a positive attitude. I tell my patients, if it makes you happy, run naked through the woods. <laughs> I think it adds to quality of life. I, I think eating and living healthy, it adds to quality of life. Does that mean they shouldn't have an ice cream sundae once in a while if they enjoy it? Uh, or a ho-ho or a yo No. I think that you should live life to its fullest and enjoy what you enjoy out of it. Um, I do refer my patients to a nutritionist, uh, particularly when they're interested in that, or integrative medicine, which is sort of a combination of, um, you know, spiritual, emotional, and nutritional support. Um, but I don't push one diet over another. Um, how do you feel when a patient wants to get a second opinion? Do you encourage it? A lot of patients are afraid of telling the doctors they want to get a second opinion. Yeah, I, um, I don't um, dissuade against it, and I do support it, um, as long as it's a good second opinion. I think if – I've had patients ask me, so uh, they haven't been uncomfortable. I'm sure in some cases they are. I think the patients and the families have to feel comfortable with who's caring for them. And if it means getting a second opinion to know that they're being treated the appropriate way, you know, I know they're being treated the appropriate way, but they don't know that they may not know of me or have may have just met me. I, I don't have an issue as long as it's a good second opinion at a reputable place. And there are those patients, um, who really feel you need to go to a major academic center. I mean, I'm involved uh, in an academic neuroscience institute in a university medical center, but some people need to have, you know, the name of the big places. They might want to go to Cornell or Duke or Sloan, and there's nothing wrong with that. Do I believe they need to do that? No, I don't. I've been practicing for 20 years. I trained at Sloan Kettering. Um, I know the quality of care that I provide. I also go out of my way to make that emotional connection with the patients and the families because I want, I want to make that connection. I want to make them feel better, not just 
from a tumor perspective, from an emotional and psychological perspective as well. Does it bother me sometimes? Of course it does. I mean, anybody would be lying to say that it didn't bother them, but do I dissuade against it? No, of course not. It's, it's something I, if, especially if I get a sense that it's something they really need to do, then they should do it. Okay, and this might be the last question. Um, Patients have been telling me that they don't want they don't want to go into a clinical trial that has a control group. Could you explain the reasoning for having a control group where they get the standard of care instead of like the tocogen, for example? Yeah. Um, so in the United States, the control group has to include a therapy that works. Outside of the United States, they can do clinical trials where the patient may not get a treatment at all. Mm -hmm. um, the if if you gave everybody the study drug and then you use that data to compare it against historical controls of patient population that didn't get that drug, you're really not doing good scientific work. You're making a lot of inferences and there's a lot of downfalls to that kind of, of, of study. And then you might wind up giving patients, lots of patients, a treatment that doesn't really work or that has very little effect, but more side effects over what they're already doing. So the purpose of a control group, as I alluded to before, is everybody gets the standard of care. Everybody gets the therapy that they know works. And then you're randomized to receive a drug that may or may not work. And the only way to know if it works is to compare in a study, a prospective, you know, moving forward kind of study, patients who got the drug who didn't get the drug. And if the patients who got the drug did better than those who didn't, and I know it's hard and, and to hear that, then you know it works and then you know everybody should get it. Doing it any other way is not doing justice, not only for the patients who are out there now diagnosed with these tumors, but all of those who will be diagnosed. So it's a very important part of clinical trial research a very important part to ensure that we're giving appropriate therapy to the right group of patients at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the questions I had. Was there anything else you want to add? No, I'm, I'm good. I'm surprised. No questions on Marinol, but that should come, or marijuana, that should come up in the future. Oh, go ahead, answer it. <laughs> what, are you, what are your feelings There's on Marinol? Absolutely, listen, marijuana, uh, smoking marijuana, medicinal marijuana, has very valid effects for certain types of diseases, refractory nausea and vomiting, refractory pain, um, glaucoma. To date, there's no data to support smoking marijuana as a means of combating um, a brain tumor. Are there studies being done on the components that are found in THC? Yes, against these tumors, yes. Most of them are in animal models. Um, everybody needs to realize, and, and this is a personal view, although I believe the FDA <laughs> agrees, you know, it's a billion dollar business and you hear more and more about it since it's been legalized in certain states, including now medicinal marijuana in New Jersey. Uh, marijuana oil, marijuana butter, uh, there's no clinical efficacy to, to those modalities to date. Um, if a patient of mine really wants it, they can go to a registered provider uh, and I won't object to it, but I don't um, push it, uh, and I certainly won't give them false hope uh, or lie saying that it's something that will help. Uh, it does come up a lot. Okay, thank you, and that concludes our webinar for this week. Um, come back again next week when we're going to have Dr. Isabel Germano. She's a neurosurgeon. Uh, as director of the Mount Sinai Comprehensive Brain Tumor Program. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much.